Good morning. It is exciting to see all of you here, and thank you and welcome to the third plenary of the 32nd annual North American CF Conference. And we're so excited to have all of you here in the audience and all of you joining us online today for a very special plenary. Over the past two days, we have been learning about scientific and medical advances in CF. And it is important that we recruit and mentor the next wave of leaders in CF care and research by recognizing the up-and-coming generation of investigators. The selection committee had many high-quality abstracts to choose from, which is why I'd like to congratulate all the junior investigators who presented their work this year. The 2018 Junior Investigator Awards go to Sebastian Raquel May from Columbia University Medical Center and Nathan Ward from Royal Adelaide Hospital. Let's give them a round of applause. Congratulations. Next, I am honored to present the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation's Mary M. Contos Care Champion Award. This award is presented to a non-physician member of the care team who has made significant contributions to the field of day-to-day -day care. Our two recipients will come up to the stage to receive their awards right after I talk about both of them and acknowledge their names. Our first recipient has devoted herself to the care of people with CF for over 25 years and has been a driver of quality improvement in the community nationally and internationally. Affectionately known as the QI Coach Who Sings, her coaching efforts have resulted in significant improvements in health outcomes at her center and many other centers across our network. Colleagues cite one of her most important skills is her ability to be a partner to her patients and families. A family with two children with CF shared it's comforting that the things we experience with our CF kids never seem to take her by surprise. She's experienced those things and knows what to do. I am proud to present the first recipient of this year's Miriam Contos Award is Lucretia Thomas, CF nurse practitioner from the University of Alabama, Children's of Alabama CF Pediatric Program and Quality Improvement Consultant, CF Learning Network. Our second recipient is a highly respected clinician and educator in our community. She was one of the first pediatric nurse practitioners in the country to be a primary provider for children with CF, and now has res primary responsibility for over 100 children and adolescents with CF and conducts her own continuity and telemedicine clinics. Her colleagues say she enhances the care of children and adolescents with CF by teaching them and empowering them to move from childhood to adulthood as experts in their self-care. Her center director shares that our pediatric pulmonary fellows will tell you that they learn CF care from her, and not just medical care, but learning how to build relationships and trust with their patients and families. I am proud to announce that the second recipient of this year's Mary M. Contos Award is Ruth DeVogue, Advanced Practice Provider, CF Program Coordinator from Colorado Children's CF Pediatric Program. <laughs> Lucretia and Ruth, please join me at the stage. Lucretia and Ruth, all of us thank you for being champions of care for our community. 
And now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Bruce Marshall, Senior Vice President of Clinical Affairs at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, who will announce another award winner in this morning's plenary. Thanks, Cindy, and congratulations to Lucretia and Ruth. Very well deserved. Good morning to everyone. I have the honor of presenting an award that spotlights the critical importance of mental and emotional wellness for people and families with cystic fibrosis. This award is a tribute to Carolyn and Rich Mattingly, whose inspiring devotion to the CF community for over 30 years has made an enduring difference. I am pleased to announce that the recipient of this year's Mattingly Award is Dr. Anna Georgiopoulos. <laughs> Anna is amazing. She's an international leader in mental health who has applied her considerable clinical and research skills to CF for over a decade. She was one of the key leaders of our ECFS, CF Foundation Mental Health Guidelines Committee. As we turned our focus to implementation after publication of the guidelines, Anna agreed to serve on our Mental Health Advisory Committee. Again, she emerged as a leader and a strong proponent of integrating mental health into the multidisciplinary approach to CF care. As an astute and caring clinician, she partners with individuals with CF and their families as an effective advocate. Anna truly embodies the Mattingly spirit of service that inspired this award. Anna, please join me on the stage to receive your award and give her another round of applause, please. This morning's plenary is entitled Partnering, the Oldest New Idea to Improve CF Care. I will begin by providing context and a personal reflection. Our improvement journey began 15 years ago with a vision of exemplary CF care and a strategic plan to strive for that vision. That plan, which we called an opportunity statement, included seven worthy goals. Many of the goals targeted the key medical outcomes that you're familiar with, FEV1, BMI, and others. Together with many of you in the room and online, we've been able to move the needle on these outcomes, and you all should be very proud. But I call your attention to this first worthy goal. Patients and families are full partners. Care will be respectful of individual patient preferences, needs, and values. This goal was drawn from a seminal publication from the Institute of Medicine entitled Crossing the Quality Chasm. This book laid out a compelling case for the existence of a quality chasm in healthcare and recommendations for closing that gap. The theme of partnership between clinicians and patients was highlighted as an important strategy to drive improvements in the system. Now for a public confession. I didn't really pay much attention to this particular goal. I was completely absorbed in how we as a community could improve the medical outcomes. But over the last several years, I've come to appreciate that care partnerships are foundational for all that we do, and how these partnerships, when informed by evidence and data, that is data used for learning, not judgment, 
That combination of partnerships informed by evidence and data is a powerful formula for high quality care. I've had an opportunity to participate in some of the meetings of our partnership champions, listening to patients, parents, care team members, and others discuss their successes and challenges. These conversations bring back memories of my days at the University of Utah caring for adults with CF. I remember how frustrated I felt working with a challenging patient and finally just giving up, going through the motions. I know that I could have done better. I also have wonderful memories of deep partnerships formed with patients and their families. I know that we made a difference in their lives and they certainly enriched my life. <clears throat> These memories, good and bad, are so vivid, never to be forgotten. I'm sure many of you have similar memories. So with that as background, I'd like to introduce our distinguished speaker this morning, Dr. Maren Batalden. She will lead us into a deeper exploration of this concept of partnerships and its significance for CF care. Maren earned a master's degree in public health in Chapel Hill at the University of North Carolina and then went on to Harvard Medical School, followed by a residency in internal medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. She provides leadership for improvement initiatives in the domains of inpatient care, care transitions, and population health projects for patients with chronic disease. She is clinically active as a hospitalist and engaged in teaching quality, safety, and systems improvement for undergraduate and graduate students as well as healthcare professionals. She is also first author on a highly cited publication in BMJ Quality and Safety entitled Co-Production of Healthcare Services. If you Google Marin Batalden and BMJ, it'll come up near the top of that search. I encourage you all to read it. It's a very provocative article. As Marin and our panelists come to the stage, Let's hear from the people who make up these partnerships, telling us what they want their partners in CF care to know. Please roll the video. I want my care team to know that it really means a lot when you give me a call to check on me when you know that I'm uh, sick or not doing well or having a rough time. I want my patient and my family to know that I try really hard to walk in your shoes and imagine how hard it must be when we have to bring up hard topics. I love hearing about special events in their life so we can celebrate together. This also gives me the opportunity to help them make any adjustments in their treatment plans so that they can fully participate in these special events. I want my care team to know how much I appreciate that they consider my family as well as myself in every aspect of my care. You're the boss and I work for you. I'm your employee. I may be a pain in the butt employee, but I work for you. Partnering is about honesty, but the tricky thing about honesty is the truth can be a difficult thing to hear and a difficult piece of news to deliver. We want to be as clinic staff held accountable to bringing family voices in so that we can provide the best care for you. CF is more than just a lung disease and I want to talk about how I work to prevent infections while having a healthy sex life. I want my care team to know that you have the power to encourage me by letting me know that we're in this fight together. I want my patients and families to know that I'm here for you, to work with you, to build a treatment plan that fits your life. I want my care team to know you don't always see me on my worst days. I want to know if somebody else in their house is on a special diet, if food is scarce sometimes, and when other people eat, and who does the grocery shopping. It all matters. You don't live in a vacuum. I want to tell my daughter's care team that as much as we work really hard to learn information about CF, that it's really hard to balance and we're always just doing our best and sometimes that doesn't feel like it's enough. When you take the time to talk to me as the spouse, it helps ease my anxiety and helps me support my husband more. I want my care team to know that I am thankful for all you guys do for me. You guys rock.
What a powerful way to get started, listening to the voices and seeing the faces of members of this amazing community. We, it's clear that this construct of partnership has deep and wide wisdom already alive here within this community. We intentionally chose to call our uh, plenary session uh, the oldest new idea to improve CF care, uh, in part to highlight that we're not here with a lot of new ideas. We're calling attention to truths that you already know. Hopefully, uh, with some uh, fresh perspectives to look anew at things that you already know. I am uh, privileged to share the stage this morning with my colleagues, Kathy Sabadosa, uh, who describes herself in this order as a mom, an advocate, and a researcher, uh, with Melanie Ab uh, Abdelner, who uh, is an adult living with CF, and with Cindy George, a nurse practitioner with many years of experience caring for patients with CF, and uh, also, as you know, working for the foundation. And my job is to frame our conversations with some ideas about partnership, and Kathy and Mel and Cindy will help weave it together to put it in the context of this CF community. So here I am uh, at seven, on the back of an elephant in Bangladesh. Uh, I am uh, visiting my grandparents who are working in Asia and South Asia to, to work on economic and community development. I'm sitting here with my mom with a very 1978 sort of hairdo uh, and my younger sister. Um, and I include the picture because I got a message from my family that I imagine is a message that uh, many of you also heard at some level from your families. And the message was that the best, the most important, the most meaningful, and the most adventurous life is a life that is lived in service to others. It took me a while to figure out what service I was called to do. After college, I worked as a community organizer, uh, I taught high school English, I did a public health degree, I finally made my way to medical school. And after medical school, I took a job at the Cambridge Health Alliance, which is a safety net health system that serves Metro Northwest Boston. And I felt like I had found a place to serve, a place with a deep commitment to mission and a commitment to social justice, public health. Imagine my surprise then, after five years working at the Cambridge Health Alliance, when I saw our patient satisfaction data for the first time. So, uh, as you may know, uh, the Press Ganey survey, which surveys patient satisfaction with their care, gives you a top box score, which tells you what percent of patients gave you the top box on some sort of a Likert scale. You want your top box scores to be high, as close to 100% as possible. And in this picture, you also see orange bars that compare you to other hospitals in the state. So this is data from Four West, where I was working as a hospitalist, working my heart out, actually, as a hospitalist every day, long hours, working with other people who seemed to be working their hearts out, doing the best they could to, to care for our patients. And I was shocked to see that we were producing patient satisfaction that looked like this. If your bars are short and they have the number one attached to them, you're the worst hospital in the state. It doesn't feel very good. So this was about 10 years ago, and it was a professional moment of transition for me, a transformation, really. At first, I saw this as a personal report card, which obviously felt lousy. But uh, over time, I came to realize that this was a report card on our system, not a personal report card. And this data, together with the work of rolling up my sleeves to try to make it better, actually helped me to see the system that I was working in. It helped me to see the other people that I was working with. It was embarrassing, but after five years of working on this unit, when I pulled a multidisciplinary team together for the first time, we actually had to start with our names. We had to start by introducing ourselves to one another. So 10 years of improvement projects later, our little black diamonds are higher and our orange bars are taller. We've reinvented many, many processes, the way we admit, the way we discharge, the way we round. I've learned to use the tools of systems improvement, process mapping, checklists, uh, 
quantitative measures mapped over time on run charts. I've used these, these tools both successfully and unsuccessfully to do all sorts of things, reduce hospital admissions and readmissions and decrease falls and central line infections and improving clinical outcomes in diabetes and opiate use disorder and depression. But something has been nagging at me about these tools, about the logic that's embedded in the frameworks that give us these tools. These tools come, for the most part, from the world of manufacturing, the, the, the production of goods rather than the making of services. And car parts, as, as you can imagine, really have no opinions about how they get assembled, about how they get put together. In, in the work that we do, though, in the world of human services, what we make is significantly more complex because the outcomes that we're making actually live in the bodies of our patients. Patients who have thoughts and feelings and opinions, who make choices and take action. Service outcomes actually cannot be made by service professionals working alone. No teacher can produce learning in a student that is passive. I see my own primary care doctor less than once a year. If I was outsourcing my health and well-being to my primary care doctor, we wouldn't get very far. My health is a function of all sorts of things my primary care doctor can't touch. My genes, my education, my income, my network of friends and families, my, my education, my behaviors, what I eat and drink and smoke and do and how I exercise, how much I sleep. Whether we like it or not, whether we like each other or not, my healthcare providers and I are co-creating my health. This is just sort of a fact about the way healthcare services work. Whether we're producing good health outcomes or bad, whether we're nice or not, we're actually producing these outcomes together. This is kind of an obvious observation, but for some reason, we health professionals have a surprising blind spot here. It's so easy for us to see our own work and to overlook the hard work of patients and families. We look at performance indicators and we see them as our own achievements or our own failures. The, this billboard, my dad took this picture in Minnesota, I think it illustrates this tendency that we have to see our own contributions in larger-than-life terms. As anybody who's ever had a baby knows, of course the University of Minnesota is not going to be handling uh, everything here, <laughs> right? I think the CF community has been calling this complementary expertise. Complementary expertise plays out differently in different contexts. Imagine a yellow bar that measures the relative weight of the contribution of the professional, with the purple representing the power and agency of the patient. If you're anesthetized having an endoscopy, the outcomes of that procedure are largely on the healthcare team. Once you come to, in the PACU, you begin to assume a little bit more agency for your care and for your outcomes. And at home, the choices that we're making every day, they may be influenced you know, in the background by advice that we've received from our healthcare team, but the outcomes are largely on us. If we, uh, m my premise here is that there's some degree of partnership that is taking place all along that spectrum and that if we pay attention to the quality of that partnership, we'll probably get better outcomes. I've been using the word co-production to define this, uh, which is maybe a little bit heady, but it's a word that others have used as well, social scientists, economists, public policy advocates. This is the definition that came from a nonprofit organization in the UK called Governance International, and I like it, it's been useful to me. Co-production is about patients and professionals making better use of each other's assets, resources, and contributions to achieve better outcomes or improved efficiency. That sounds good. How do we do that? In some ways, I feel like it's an audacious suggestion for me to be making in this community where it's clear that medical outcomes have resulted from a tremendous amount of innovation in the space of biotechnology and pharmaceutical agents. Is it, is it really fair to call attention to the power of partnerships to create outcomes? So many people hoping for and working towards smart and smarter drugs, designing procedures and technologies that we couldn't even imagine in the not too distant past. But all the drugs, all this technology, these are tools, tools in a toolbox, tools that we use in the context of these relationships. 
It's a relationship that helps us to decide what tools we need to develop or which tool is the right tool to use now, or how well a tool is working. All of this happens in the context of relationships. So my argument is that we'll be able to develop better tools and use them more effectively if our partnerships are strong. Is there evidence for this proposition that relationships have potency? The science is young, but there is increasing evidence from all sorts of places that more effective communication reduces risk factors for heart disease and mortality for myocardial infarction. The teaching communication skills to residents lowers heart failure readmissions. More collaborative physicians have patients with better blood sugar control. Patients who are more likely to take their medicines for hypertension and HIV. Patients who are more likely to complete recommended cancer screening. Effective communication actually improves survival in metastatic breast cancer. On the other side of the equation as well, more than 180 studies have been done using Judith Hibbard's construct called patient activation. Perhaps not surprisingly, activated patients, people with the knowledge and skills and confidence to manage their own health and healthcare, have better health outcomes and maybe even cost less. In some ways, it, it feels almost quixotic to subject this profoundly messy human stuff of partnership to the world of randomized controlled trials, but that's our currency, that's our vocabulary. So this clever meta-analysis looked at 13 trials in a variety of health conditions to try and calculate the global impact of the patient-professional relationship on health outcomes. They measured an effect size of 0.11, which for the statisticians in the room is a small but statistically identifiable uh, impact. To put it in context, five years of baby aspirin has an effect size of 0.06 on heart disease. Eight years without cigarettes has an effect size of 0.08 on mortality. So partnerships actually have a measurable impact. My guess is, though, that our research doesn't really even begin to measure the power of partnership. My colleagues and I uh, drew a picture to help us think about this. It's not rocket science, but it helps me organize my thoughts and we'll organize uh, our talk together today. At the core is a relationship between patients and professionals. And that relationship unfolds, takes place in the context of a healthcare system. That healthcare system constrains or facilitates the power of this partnership to produce some sort of outcome. Uh, we measure these outcomes in this community. It's FEV1, it's BMI, it's little black diamonds, it's orange bars, it's ED rates per thousand. And these outcomes are linked in some way to outcomes that really matter, that are harder for us to measure. That's living a full and vital life with cystic fibrosis across the, the illness spectrum. If our outcomes that we measure get untethered to the outcomes that we don't measure, we get into trouble. And it's surprisingly hard for us to keep those outcomes tethered. These dynamics, of course, take place in the context of a wider and community and society that also have impacts on our health outcomes. Obviously, it's not drawn to scale. That outside circle should be a whole lot bigger. All these lines are dashed, not solid, because this is quite fluid. Uh, patients and professionals are members of the healthcare system and influence it and shape it. Um, one of the reasons I like this picture is that it's, it's like a map. It shows us territory in which we might focus our efforts to improve if we want to improve partnership to get better outcomes. We're going to start by exploring the center space, that space where patients and professionals actually come together. This is the place where the voices from the video uh, actually have their impact. This is the place where we either listen or don't, where we tell the truth or, where, or, we, or we don't. This is the place where we see one another as whole people or fail to see one another as whole people, where we respect or don't respect one another's expertise. Uh, this partnership is not an either-or proposition. Uh, I got this slide from a, a patient advocate a colleague of mine named Meg Gaines in Wisconsin, and she repurposed it from Canada. But I like it because it describes this sort of spectrum in which we might develop ourselves as partners. We can move from left to right here. Let's imagine that on the left, 
Uh, the big turquoise sphere represents the health professional. We could use it in a different way, but for now, let's say the big sphere is the, is the health professional, and the little spheres are patients and families. On the left, we start where all the arrows are emanating from the big turquoise sphere. This is, this is our sweet spot for the most part as health professionals. We went to school for this. We like talking. We like giving advice. We like telling people what to do. Uh, the data suggests we're probably not as good at it as we think, since people only remember about 20% of what we say after they leave the office visit. In my own experience, as a former teacher, I have prided myself on my ability to talk and explain things. I, I draw pictures on the whiteboard in the hospital room. When I started using TeachBack, I realized actually how little of what I was communicating was landing. We grow from left to right. First, we learn to listen. The data tells us that doctors interrupt their patients after about 11 seconds. I'm sure that other health professionals are a little better, but we probably all have room to, room to improve here. And then we move into this space of double-headed arrows, where there's actually bi-directional conversation. There are lots of tools that help us do this better. Here in the conference, I've seen workshops on motivational interviewing and shared decision-making. These tools are incredibly helpful and have an evidence base. They actually improve the quality of these double-headed arrows. In my own practice as a hospitalist, one of my most useful tools is a camp stool. I round with a stool so that I can sit down. It turns out that the quality of my conversations are better when I sit down. Cindy George was telling me yesterday about uh, a CF mom on an improvement team who suggested the power of opening the door and saying hello with your naked face before you put up the mask. My guess is that's another tool that helps in this bi-directional communication space. But the co-production magic starts to happen here, where we've got more arrows moving in lots of different directions. This is when we bring the whole family into the conversation, or the multidisciplinary team really starts working together, or patients and families with CF connect with one another. And finally, we get to this most existential space where the size of the turquoise sphere has actually gotten a little smaller. This is a place where we have uh, genuine mutual respect for all of the complementary expertise in the room. In my own experience as a hospitalist, this is discovering that I'm not the best person to decide whether somebody needs to be admitted to the hospital or whether they're ready to be discharged. I have a piece of it, to be sure, but the patient holds an awful lot of the information that, that needs to go into this decision. What's the context of the life that they're returning to? How confident do they feel about the things that they need to do to take care of themselves? This process uh, of moving along this journey, uh, even though the turquoise sphere is getting smaller, I have not experienced it as a diminishing kind of feeling. I've actually experienced it as quite enlivening. So like those turquoise spheres, it's a journey for everyone. For health professionals, often it's a journey in learning to listen uh, and, and learning humility. For patients and families, it's often a journey of growing in confidence and learning to speak up. In CF care, patients and families and care teams have a lot of time together, time to cultivate this partnership. Because this is an illness that presents in children who grow up to be adults, there's a natural evolution in the heart of the story of this community that serves almost as a metaphor for the kind of relational growth that we're talking about. Let's listen to the story of one of those partnerships evolving over time. My name is Dr. Donna Beth Willie Corand, and I've been Betsy's CF doctor since she was about a year and a half old. Hey, Bets. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. You getting ready for college? Yes. Yes. Okay, so tell me. I when? definitely feel like I've changed in my approach to caring for patients with CF. You realize that not everything you say is going to be followed exactly as you say it. The approach that I take with patients now is, I think, a little bit more open to understanding that there's more to life than CF. My name is Betsy Sullivan, and I will be attending St. Edwards University in the fall. Take a listen to you, see what okay. you sound like, okay? One of the best right. things about Dr. Willie Cran is that she realizes that I have a life outside of CF, and she really works to find the best treatment that works with my schedule so that I don't have to sacrifice all these things that I enjoy. 
Betsy has definitely not always done what I've asked her to do, and um, we've had our struggles with that. And times where I confront her and she explains to me very clearly why she doesn't want to take what I've recommended. I try to figure out why she's not doing it and you know, hope that we can meet in the middle and try to figure out how to deliver the best care for her. As challenging as some moments are in our relationship, I've been proud of Betsy a lot of different times. When she initiates a phone call or an email to say, hey, I'm wondering about this medicine, is this giving me the side effect? I feel a lot of pride in, in the fact that, that she's doing that. Okay, there we go. So My relationship with Betsy and her mom and her father um, is a wonderful relationship. I have other patients who I have similar relationships to and some patients that I don't have as good of a relationship with. My relationship with Betsy um, is in part the way it is because of my relationship I've had longitudinally with her parents when she was younger. And she lets me know exactly what she thinks, good, bad, and ugly. And, uh, and that's great because it's a much more honest relationship now. So what do you think of her colors? Um, maybe like a light pink. I think the most difficult thing about going away to college and having CF is going to be figuring out my new schedule. Occasionally I'll be like, hey mom, I'm kind of in a rush, could you sterilize some nubs for me? Or dad, I have a lot of homework, could you set up my feeding bag for me? And they're always like, yes, of course. And now in college I'm going to have to do it all on my own no matter what my schedule is. I think continuing to have discussions about that is really going to be vital to my success in college. Like Mary, I'm a mom, Jack's mom, and like Betsy, Jack started his first year. He's also transitioning to Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Jack arrived at college. <laughs> Jack arrived at college with his vest and his meds and having to figure out how to live with CF on his own in a new place. At the request of the adult care team in Kingston, he also brought a paper copy of his medical record and a letter from his pediatric team. That's him with Lynn from the pediatric care team at Dartmouth. The letter starts with the details of his PFTs and his cultures and his labs, but the last paragraph begins, it is with no small sadness that we transition Jack to you for the adult care in the context of his university experience. Seeing Jack take this next step is a dream come true. And as his mom, I was proud, anxious, and deeply grateful. He is setting off on a new adventure, not only leaving us, but leaving the care team that has been with him since his early days of life. To prepare for today, I called the coordinator, Lisa Smith, in Kingston to ask her for her impressions of the letter and record. That's him having crossed over to the other side an adult care in Kingston. She told me how it made her feel very emotional. It was beautiful and heartfelt. She said she could tell that Jack had a really good relationship with his care team, and they were close. It was clear they were proud of him and going to miss him. They were handing him over in a very human touch, and the record was comprehensive and well-organized. It was more than they could have asked for. At this point, tears are rolling down my cheeks. As a mom, having listening to him, recognize, listening to her, recognize the power of the relationship and the partnership, and how important that was in Jack's care, was heartwarming. I went with Jack to meet Lisa the day before he moved in. She gave him the paperwork to register as a patient, and the phone numbers and emails to contact her, and a tour of where he would need to go for the visit. As he spoke with her and they engaged in conversation, I could see the beginning of a new partnership. As hard as it is for me as a mom, I know Lisa and Jack are ready to start his new chapter as an adult with CF. It is with no small sadness. The intimacy of that phrase always kind of catches in my throat. As the mom of a 13-year-old boy, I have a little taste of the pain and joy associated with watching kids grow up and letting them go. But the intensity 
of the vulnerability and the strength that this illness introduces into that process and the power of the care team uh, in that transition is mind-boggling. So this diagram uh, maps territory, as I said. Uh, What would it mean uh, if we were to extend an invitation to full partnership to our patients? Uh, In my own improvement work, I've been experimenting with putting more treatment decisions in our patients' hands. Uh, We were working to try to improve care for patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and after a series of interviews, it became clear that patients really had no tools in their toolbox when their illness started to flare, and the emergency department was the only reasonable option. So we wondered, what if we gave people a little packet, a rescue pack with steroids and antibiotics, and they could initiate treatment on their own and then call their doctor? It seems as though with that simple little intervention, we've probably reduced hospitalizations by about 50%. The other thing we've been doing is paying attention to orienting and prepping patients for the roles that we want them to play in the healthcare system. As health professionals, we had lots of years of training for our roles, but patients and families are thrust into this role without any preparation at all. Working with one of my colleagues on improving the care of older patients with dementia, uh, again, a series of interviews uncovered that patients actually didn't know how to contact their care team after hours. So something as simple as a refrigerator magnet with a phone number has reduced our ED visits in a statistically significant way. People, including people with CF, are different from one another in so many ways, in age and social location and personality and style. The word patient, which is Latin from from the root that means one who suffers, conjures up sort of a degree of passivity. But we know that people want to engage as makers and shapers of their lives, even in the face of serious illness and especially in the face of a chronic condition like, like cystic fibrosis. Um, people may not always prioritize their health or their health uh, decisions in the same way that their health care team does, but people want to engage as, as makers and shapers of their lives. These partnerships can be tough, working as I do in a safety net system. I think I sort of gravitate towards tough partnerships. About half of the patients that I care for speak English, and many struggle mightily against forces that compromise their health and also their ability to seek and receive help. Substance use and abuse, histories of trauma, crippling depression and anxiety, poverty and homelessness. But this construct of co-production reminds us that health outcomes, good and bad, are inevitably co-produced. Whether we partner poorly or well, whether it's easy or hard, not partnering is just not an option. Victor Montori, uh, who works at the Mayo Clinic, coined the term minimally disruptive medicine, and he invites us to think about this construct, uh, the relationship between workload and capacity. Everybody has a life workload related to managing their household and their family and feeding the dog. The disease and medical treatment creates additional work, appointments, medications, self-care, airway airway clearance. The workload that is imposed by the treatment for cystic fibrosis, as we know, can be staggering. Everybody also has some capacity for managing that workload, capacity that's determined by their biography and their social circumstances. Uh, Chronic illness not only adds work, but also diminishes capacity as physical health and well-being, emotional health and well-being, determine this capacity that we have for managing the work. This has also been a useful construct for me in thinking about partnership. I feel like it is our job as health professionals to try to understand the burden of the work that we are imposing uh, and to think creatively about how we can strengthen capacity. Another take on this workload capacity dynamic uh, comes from Stephanie Hansen, an adult living with CF uh, in Texas. Uh, I read a post from her on the listserv that taught me about spoon theory. This is a theory that comes from a woman named Christine living with lupus. She says living with a chronic illness is like starting every day with a finite number of spoons. Everything has a spoon cost. Breakfast is a spoon getting showered and dressed is two spoons, going to the gym is four spoons. When you run out, you're done. 
As a person without a chronic illness, I have the luxury of starting most days with a sense of an infinite and inexhaustible supply of spoons. Not so with a chronic illness. Stephanie wrote, I do weight training four to five times a week, and I expend a majority of my day's energy in the gym. My CF team sees the results of my hard work in the gym in the form of my high PFTs, but no one seems to really see the no one, no one really seems to recognize the toll it takes or has ever offered any solutions. Most days I spend my spoons in the gym, so other things inevitably suffer. Allocating those spoons is always a trade-off. Let's hear it from Mel's perspective. As an adult living with CF, Mel has logged a lot of experience with partnership in CF care. What has she noticed? What strengthens and enables partnerships in CF care? What gets in the way? Thank you, Maren. I am so honored to be here and just a little bit terrified. (laughs) So I'm here because I have CF, but I am not CF. I'm a human being, just like most of you are here as clinicians and scientists, but that's not who you are. That's what you do. You're human beings as well. In my 38 years, I have seen countless clinicians. My most productive partnerships all have one thing in common, shared humanity. And the truth is, I react better with clinicians who look me in the eye as they speak with me, who ask me about my life outside of CF, who really listen when I'm sharing, and with those who share a small sliver of their own human side. You see, it's what connects us and makes the uncomfortable moments a little easier to navigate. Take, for instance, one clinic visit I had with a longtime trusted provider. On this particular day, he wasn't himself. He was quiet and distant. I left feeling as though I'd said something offensive, and I didn't like that feeling. So I risked a little more discomfort to reach out and ask. It turns out it wasn't about me at all. He had just gotten some sad news about a friend and was simply having a tough day. It was a perfect reminder for me that clinicians are humans just like us, that we all have off days. His honesty that day was a strength, not a weakness, and it helped to give me more patience and empathy for my clinicians. Now, one thing that drives me crazy, when clinicians look at a screen and type as they're talking with me, right? (laughs) You see... Shared humanity is dependent on the flow of energy between us. So when you're looking away at a screen, it's as though an invisible partition goes up between us and it stunts that flow. That connection is lost. For me, it feels dehumanizing. Instead of feeling open and honest and vulnerable, I'm just watching the clock counting down the minutes till I can run for the hills. Think about it. If the human connection weren't such a pivotal part of healthcare, I'd be talking to a room full of robots right now. And if all of your patients were robots, your jobs would be so boring, <laughs> right? We need each other. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mel. These relationships are glaciers. We only see the tiny little bit that pokes up above the surface. And Mel just told us a story of taking a risk to lower the water line, to invite a little bit more of that relationship into the room, a little bit more of the power of that connection. But Mel also uh, raised the specter of the way in which the digital revolution is erupting in the middle of our partnerships 
Uh, it is transforming them and reinventing them. It is ruining them. It is strengthening them. It is changing everything. The internet tells us that there are 325,000 mobile health apps, and the rate at which that is growing is absolutely exponential. The, all, all of this technology is empowering people to take charge of their health and their health behaviors in new ways. It's making new kinds of data available to everyone. It's raising expectations on transparency and convenience. It's connecting people to one another in new ways. It's blurring the boundaries on privacy with smart drugs and smart inhalers and Fitbits that automatically track my steps in my doctor's electronic medical record. Like the drug pipeline, this digital technology it's tools, tools in a toolbox that we have to employ in the context of caring relationships. How can we use these tools to maximal effect in improving the quality of our partnerships? Vital work that patients and families do in helping one another to produce good health is often invisible to health professionals. I often wonder if we aren't missing opportunities to support and strengthen the quality of these critical networks. One of my colleagues, a nurse improver in Sweden, was working with a group of NICU nurses to improve outcomes in, uh, in, in a neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit. And she was walking through the unit, came upon a mom holding a baby with a smartphone. The, the project that she was working on with the nurses was to develop a brochure of frequently asked questions. And when she engaged this mom in conversation, it turns out the mom was on her phone, networked with thousands of other new parents in NICUs all around the world, uh, asking frequently asked questions and getting answers and sharing concerns. Now, it's not to say that social media, uh, social media we know is as effective at communicating untruths as it is communicating truths, but we would do well in our own improvement work to remember the context in which people are actively learning and managing their, uh, their illness. So how might we actually better enlist the strengths and assets of all in producing better outcomes and greater efficiency? The CF Foundation commissioned this study of the community. Uh, not surprising, I guess, doctors are the go-to people for understanding frontiers in research and clinical care, but preferentially people seek peers in managing the day-to-day -day work of staying healthy, keeping up with treatments, navigating emotional health and life demands. The medical anthropology literature distinguishes between disease and illness. Disease is the medical stuff that we tend to prioritize and, uh, and make the focus of our concern as health professionals, but illness is what the patient lives with. It includes disease, but so much more. The sense of self that's shaped by the symptoms and the diagnosis, the meaning we make of it, strategies for coping, keeping it all in perspective. Managing illness is integrally linked with managing disease, but it's not the same. Uh, and it may well be that peers are better at helping one another manage illness uh, than we in the health professions uh, system actually are. So back to the model. We've explored this space between the microdynamics of the relationship. Uh, we've explored the, oops, sorry. We've explored the territory uh, labeled patients. Now let's turn to the territory that's labeled professionals. Uh, if we want to work with professionals to make them better partners, what should we do? Uh, how should we train ourselves? How should we reward and promote? One of my favorite health systems pulls for partnership by including an overnight stay in the hospital as part of orientation for all new staff. People sleep in johnnies and take turns feeding one another to understand the vulnerability associated with illness. Any conversation about health professionals and their capacity for partnership has to start with the epidemic of health professional burnout. Uh, increasing complexity of the contemporary healthcare enterprise is probably at the root of this. The busyness of our days, the number of things we have to do and document, the challenge of coordinating so many pieces and people, the pace of change related to digitization, the sense of scarcity related to time and resources. Sometimes we fear that being better partners will just mean more work. I know that my residents are often unhappy when I suggest rounding at the bedside. It'll take longer. It will, keep it, it will keep us from doing our uh, electronic medical record work that we need to do during rounds. But I suspect that when we, get, when we get it right, these are not actually competing goals. My guess is that better partnership actually also means more joy in work, less burnout. Ironically, perhaps the QI movement has contributed to this. On the left, we have a health professional and a patient in relationship, responding to one another in the here and now. In the center, we see these symbols of industrialized medicine, 
metrics and guidelines and productivity. Ideally, we use these metrics for learning, not judgment, and it holds us to our better selves. But sometimes, for all sorts of reasons, not always of our own making, these uh, symbols of industrialized medicine get the best of us, and we turn our attention away from the patient in front of us. My hunch is that this simultaneously leaves patients feeling abandoned and drains some of the joy out of our own work. Patients we know are not in one-on-one partnerships with individual clinicians working in isolation. Rather, they're in partnership with multidisciplinary teams. So often I hear and see again what I learned from those uh, little black diamonds and those orange bars, that one-on-one our partnerships are not so bad, but collectively we make a lousy partner. We make people tell us the same thing again and again. We give conflicting advice. We drop the ball, uh, leaving people feeling pretty vulnerable and alone. Now, the, the conversation about multidisciplinary teamwork in healthcare is everywhere. The CF Foundation helped the CF community prioritize multidisciplinary teamwork decades ago. Imagine the team members in your, care, uh, in, in your care center standing in a circle holding ropes that connect them to one another. Imagine the strength and tautness of those ropes representing the health of those relationships between members. Patients and families, we might imagine, are held by this web. Dysfunctional relationships create holes that patients and families fall through. My colleague, Jody hoffer Gattel at Brandeis, calls this web relational coordination. And she's developed a formal way to measure it in groups and in organizations. Effective groups with high degrees of relational coordination have shared goals, shared knowledge and understanding, mutual respect, and their communication is timely, accurate, frequent, and focused on problem solving rather than blaming. She has studied this construct in many, many industries. If you put relational coordination on one axis, it doesn't even matter what outcome you use on the other axis. Quality, safety, satisfaction of patients, satisfaction of staff. It turns out that stronger relational coordination creates better outcomes. Back to our conceptual model. Uh, our ability to engage as co-productive partners is shaped by the healthcare system that we work in. What if we made partnership between patients and health professionals a core design principle of our healthcare system? How can leaders create the conditions that make for effective partnership? How could we reach outside those porous boundaries of the healthcare system to build bridges that improve the strength of that partnership? CF, of course, has an amazing story in this domain. The CF Foundation, at, at its root, is an advocacy organization amplifying the voice of patients and families to influence the care system, to pull for better partnership, to produce better outcomes. The network of care teams and care centers that come together at this conference and all the patients and families in the digital universe creates an almost unbelievable platform for furthering partnership. At this level, when we look at all these double-headed arrows, we're not just talking about individual partnerships in the clinical encounter, but also networks between care centers, including clinicians and researchers and patients and families. When the foundation talks about co-production, about patients and professionals making better use of each other's assets and resources and contributions to achieve better outcomes and better efficiency, they're talking about mobilizing a lot of assets and resources. Let's listen to Cindy tell us about how the foundation is working to create the conditions for effective partnership. Thank you very much, Maren. Central to the CF Foundation's efforts to address all aspects of this disease is the partnership between individuals and families living with CF and the clinical care teams. And we can use the co-production model to map out the multiple initiatives to enable greater partnership. Let's first start by looking at the space where people with CF and family members and clinicians come together. And the initiatives I'm going to share with you right now are about optimizing the bi-directional sharing of information so that together information can be looked at for sharing of care plan decision making. One of these ways is by collaboratively planning for visits, where agendas reflect what's important to individuals and family members and also to the care teams. Another way is to share smart reports, which are individual-level patient reports that can be used to facilitate discussions on personal health trends. 
And because we know that it can be difficult sometimes to navigate challenge or care conversations, we have a brand new par- program called the Partnership Enhancement Program, or PEP. And this aims to really help make those conversations a little bit more comfortable by offering training and relationship-centered communication skills for clinicians and also testing out resources like the five ways to partner for patients and families and clinicians. And it's also important that we support partnership at the level of the healthcare system so that we meet the individuals and, pati- and families' needs. We are doing this by integrating mental health into standard CF care because we know no health, there's no health without mental health. We have when we're providing a robust set of educational resources and clinical guidelines to help inform those decisions of care. We're exploring new research, such as the Success with Therapies Research Consortium, that is looking for interventions that help support people in sustaining the CF regimen at home. And we are bringing together individuals with CF, family members, and care teams as groups to, in QI, excuse me, quality improvement, learning collaboratives, and network. So they are testing on innovative processes that most impact the quality of care. And to further inform this improvement, we have healthcare service measures such as the patient registry and the experience of care survey, which both tra- provide transparency data to improve experience. Excuse me, to improve care at, at the delivery of care, and also for anonymized feedback that patients and families can share on how they perceive the care they receive. All used to improve the delivery and experience of care. And at our level of the community and society, our foundation has a robust policy and advocacy program to ensure there's a healthcare system that works for individuals and families. And because we know that CF can be an isolating disease, we have these programs and many others where we're connecting the community so that no one has to feel alone. These are an abundance of resources and networks that are available to all of you, and I applaud many of you and many of you online who are participating already in these. And let's, as a community, all try to test and adopt new ways to strengthen this vital partnership. Thank you. That's what it looks like, I think, to make partnership a core design principle of a healthcare system. So as we uh, as we come to a close, we return back to the construct of outcomes where we began. Uh, as I think you have heard, uh, my premise here is that these outcomes that we are producing, we're co-producing them, and if we improve the quality of our partnerships, we'll improve the quality of our outcomes. Um, The, all of this work that uh, has been done within the CF community to improve outcomes, uh, drug development and shared metrics and transparency and linking care centers together, uh, all of this work um, at the root of it is this, are these partnerships that we, we can't always uh, see. And this is an opportunity to see those partnerships that are at root in creating these outcomes. M- my hunch is that actually leaning into these partnerships not only will improve these outcomes that we measure, but is fundamental for improving these outcomes that we can't measure, the unquantifiable uh, vitality of life that we hope uh, people with cystic fibrosis uh, will enjoy at every stage of the illness. And the only way that we get there is by leaning into the quality of these partnerships. Uh, the only way that we get to moving beyond what's the matter with you to what matters to you is leaning into these partnerships. I'm on service tomorrow, or Monday, I guess, as a hospitalist uh, for another seven-day stretch. I, in my own personal life as a clinician, I've made this idea of leaning into partnerships something of a personal mantra, and I experiment with new things every time I'm on service. A few months ago, I discovered it was possible to call consultants using the bedside phone of my patients. And a few months later, I discovered it was possible to put that on speakerphone so that we could all participate. Uh, it's an ongoing experiment, little, little tiny things we can do to improve the quality of our partnership with patients and families. This experimentation has made my own work much more meaningful and more satisfying. 
May it be so for you as well. And Mel will, as it should be, have the last word. Hello again, my fellow humans. Look, there's no such thing as a perfect partnership. It's like a muscle we need to keep exercising and working on. I know I, for one, have been so inspired this morning, and I realized that one thing I can do differently moving forward is to speak up more when things don't feel quite right. I invite all of you to reflect as well and take whatever has resonated with you back to your care centers. Share with your colleagues. And when you catch yourself going back on autopilot or lost in a computer screen, stop. Stop and look at the patients sitting before you. See the human beings that we are. Because the truth of the matter is, our lives depend on it. <laughs>